Well, good morning. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on site and those joining us online this morning as well. We are continuing our series called Bless, where we are looking at five steps to loving others well. And the, and the basis of these five steps comes from kind of gleaning from Jesus' ministry how he blessed people. And you know, these past couple of weeks, we're on to week three of this now, we're on to the E of this acronym. And, and over the past couple of weeks, I've been so encouraged by the stories that I'm hearing, how people are applying these first two steps of this acronym. I'm hearing uh, stories about how people are beginning with the B. They're, they're beginning with prayer. They're, they're beginning their day. They're beginning meeting. They're, before they walk into a cafe, before they answer a phone call, they're beginning with prayer. Just a short little prayer, basically saying, Lord, I'm available to be a blessing in this moment as the Holy Spirit guides. And, and then having eyes to see what God's doing, having ears to listen to the prompts, and most importantly, the courage to step forward when they see those things. And, and by doing that, they're, they're seizing opportunities to live out the L, the, the listen, as they're listening to other people's stories. And they're, they're genuinely asking, how are you doing? They're genuinely sitting and listening to, to people's histories and stories and the needs that exist in people's lives. Uh, I'm hearing accounts of how people have been practicing this and they've, they've met their neighbors for the first time. They, they may have lived beside somebody for a while, but they're actually intentionally engaging and listening to their neighbors for the first time. Uh, people who, who were asked, how are you doing? What's happening? And they genuinely want to know what's happening. And, and People are hearing of needs and bringing people to second stories, our, 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 free, uh, our free second-hand store we have here at West Meadows, and, and being able to meet some of those needs in people's lives. Uh, by, by listening to stories, I'm hearing accounts of how kind of walls of uh, protective walls are being broken down, and people are finally expressing that they're struggling with depression and, and that they're lonely and that they have medical issues, that they're just they're keeping to themselves, and there's freedom in these things. It's, it's amazing to see. You know, this is something that I practice. I, I try to practice in my own life, because I really believe that when we begin with prayer and we genuinely want to listen to people, that wonderful things can happen. And, and so I, I try to remember at the start of each day, at the, at the start of each staff meeting we have, uh, yesterday we had a board retreat here, and at the beginning of our board retreat, we prayed these things. And, and, and the more that I do this, and, and the more that I reflect upon this, because I, I, I want to model and teach this for all of us here, I'm reminded that we as church leaders need to do this too. Like, not, not just the praying part. We get so good at the praying part, but, but as church leaders, we need to be committed regularly to listening as well. And so I just want to take a minute just right now before I get into the third part of our series today, just to remind you that, that, that we are listening. That, that I want to assure you that my door is open. I have never said no to somebody who wants to come talk to me. Now, sometimes people assume that I'm too busy for them, and so they don't ask. But I can tell you this, people who ask, I have always said yes. I will always make time. And so if I have come up to you in the foyer when you're new and said, hey, I'd love to hear your story, I, I mean it. I would genuinely love to sit down and hear your story. If you have a question or a concern or something that's happening here at West Meadows, like, let me know whether it's in, in your life or if it's in ministry. We're interested. We genuinely want to listen and to make sure that you know that you are heard. You know, and, and there are times when those encounters, you might be able to recognize this as well, when, when you feel like, okay, we've got to have a conversation about something. And, and it's almost like there's this natural tendency when you know that there's this upcoming conversation to have that, that you know, maybe, maybe we should go grab a coffee and talk about that. You ever said that? Well, let's go talk about it over coffee. Or, or maybe you've said, I'd say this one all the time, let's talk about it over lunch. Let's go do lunch together and talk about it. You know, and there's just something natural about that, isn't there? Because there's things that just go together better sometimes. It's like, it's like, it's like peanut butter and jelly. Like, like peanut butter is awesome, right? Jelly, I don't know. Would you ever just take like a spoon of jelly? But you take a spoonful of jelly and put it on some peanut butter. Now we've got, we've got something happening, right? Like things just go better together. Peanut butter and jelly go better together. Well, so too does listening and eating sometimes. And guess what our E is in this acronym. One of my favorite things to do, one of the reasons that I'm not a little skinnier than I am, I love to eat. So I'm a Baptist pastor, right? We, we love to eat. It's kind of the things that we're kind of known for is the eating. Now here's what I want you to know about eating. It doesn't matter when you eat, where you eat, or what you're eating. I think we know this is true from our personal experiences. Something special happens. There's this power that happens when we eat together. Isn't it true? When you get around a table with some people, there's just a certain dynamic that happens, isn't there? 
especially when it happens around a table when we know that the purpose is to get to know another person, genuinely get to know another person. Now, an example of this went viral a couple years back where this photo that's up on the screen here uh, was snapped and posted on Facebook. And what we see in this photo here is a, is a lady named Jen, she's the elderly lady there, who was alone one day at McDonald's having lunch. And she saw over towards the window that there was a young man who's sitting alone. And so she just walked up to him and said, may I join you? Without hesitation, this young man said, of course you can join me. And Jan sat down and this young man introduced himself as Eric. And they shook hands and they spent the next 45 minutes eating and sharing and laughing together. They talked about art, and they talked about church. They talked about Eric's young son. Uh, and, and Jan shared some life advice that she had gained over her years. She, she said, Eric, you, you need to learn to love people no matter who they are. Never judge anyone because you just never know what kind of day they've been having or what they've been going through. There's, there's maybe some good, good truth in there. But the meal was done. They exchanged phone numbers, and Eric walked Jan to her car, and they both ended the event feeling blessed. Now, there was another lady in the restaurant, in this McDonald's in Indiana, who saw this taking place and was moved by the experience that she snapped this picture. And she shared it on social media, and it went viral. Why? Why did it go viral? Well, I want to suggest to you, because it's rare to see something like this happen. It, it, it touches something that people in this world need. A shared meal? Sometimes. But what's behind? What does it represent? You see, this shared meal between two strangers who genuinely just shared time around a table to get to know each other broke through the individualistic aspects of our society and extended a gift, extended a blessing of goodwill and friendship to one another. And today, that's what I want to talk to you about, is this third step of how we can love each other is about understanding the good Baptist theology that a table can be a place of blessing. So, how do we see this in Jesus' ministry? Well, uh, consider, I, I think it won't take long to see that this is very common, wasn't it? We, we get a sense that eating was central to Jesus' mission when we read the Gospels. And, and it's one of the ways that I think he really showed love to others. You know, even as I say that, if you're familiar with some of the stories that we find in the New Testament, you're probably already thinking of instances where Jesus was sharing a teaching, sharing his time, sharing in, in a moment around a table. Uh, for example, let's do a quick quiz here. What was happening, where was Jesus when he did his very first miracle? He was at a wedding feast. He was at a wedding feast the first time he did his miracle. What did Jesus do with the five loaves and two fishes? How many did he feed? 5,000 people he fed. And in the upper room one night, before he was arrested and crucified, the Last Supper takes place. The Passover, I'll take Passover meal as well. And then after Jesus' resurrection, when Peter sees Jesus on the beach, what's he doing? He's cooking breakfast. <laughs> you know, if you open the Gospel of Luke, we actually find that Luke shares 10 stories where Jesus is dining and listening with people. It was a significant part of how Jesus did ministry. Now, many of these were dinner parties where Jesus is sitting, invited to come sit in a person's home and recline at their table in their home. But if you keep reading through these stories, you find that it reaches a point where Jesus just starts inviting himself over to people's houses. Remember Zacchaeus? Hey, Zacchaeus, come out of that tree. I'm going to eat at your house today. Zacchaeus was thrilled, but he starts inviting himself over to people's places because it carried meaning and it carried significance. So we see multiple examples in the Gospel of Luke, but I want to look at one in particular from the uh, Gospel of Matthew, one of the very first times that we see Jesus at one of these dinner parties. And if you want to turn to that, you can use the Pew Bibles, found on, found on page uh, 790, Matthew 9, or you can use the Pew Portal, scan that code on the pew in front of you, it'll take you right to our sermon notes. And, and this is one of the very first times that Jesus is at a dinner party. And now we don't know who invited who, we're not told. But what we do know from this account is that while we don't know who invited who, we do know that people were divided over the fact that Jesus attended. And here's what we read, Matthew 9, starting in verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. 
Now, I don't know who invited who, but while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many other tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Something to note here. Matthew's writing about himself. Did you ever notice that? Did you ever pause to realize that? Matthew's writing about himself. Matthew is indicting himself. He's, he's including himself in kind of the scum that Jesus is having dinner with that the Pharisees are so upset about. You see, Matthew, as he says here, is a tax collector. And, and some of us are familiar with this concept that, that tax collectors at this time were Jewish people, you know, people of Jewish descent who worked to collect taxes for Rome. So they were considered traitors by their fellow Jewish people. And they got wealthy by adding a surtax to what they collected. And they could choose how big that surtax was. And so they are also thieves. And the only parties that Matthew would ever get invited to were parties that you could attend with other traitorous thieves and sinners just like him. And now that term sinners is kind of this catch-all, catch-all term. It, it really refers to anybody who is, who is non-religious, who really you know, could care less about, about living for God. They were kind of non-religious. They were not trying to live righteously. They, they maybe had an illicit lifestyle that was kind of known to the community. So they got put into this class of, uh, of sinners. And so Jesus is having dinner at Matthew's house with a bunch of other tax collectors, with prostitutes, and all sorts of other heathens are gathered around. And this was hard for a lot of people to accept. See, because in the ancient Near East, when you had dinner, when you ate with somebody, it was a declaration, it was a statement of friendship and affirmation. By sitting around a table with a person, you gave them dignity. You, you communicated respect. You said to them, hey, I, there's, there's some value, there's some worth in you that I would sit at this table with you. Therefore, who Jesus eats with is somewhat of an indication to these Pharisees of who he identifies with, of, of the social class that he is, he, is, he is trying to hang out with, of, of who he cares about. And we can kind of appreciate this, even though we have a bit more of an individualistic society where it doesn't carry all the same meanings. I think we can relate to this a little bit, can't we? Like, like if somebody sends you a dinner invitation, it's a special thing. Like, like it feels very special to be invited over for dinner. But when you receive that dinner invitation, a lot of people will go through a bit of a process of filtering the invitation before they respond. And not everybody, but I think we'll acknowledge that this is true if some people at least will receive that invitation and they'll think to themselves, is this somebody I want to be seen with? Is this somebody I'd really be comfortable hanging out with? Is this a person I'd want to share my life with? And if I were to share my life with them, could they relate to me? Could I relate to them? Would would we get along? Now, as I verbalize that, it might sound kind of rude, it might sound kind of awful, but, but do we agree that there's truth in this, that there are some people who process these invitations, who we will have dinner with, who we will associate with, and who we won't, through kind of the insider-outsider language. Does that make sense? Have you experienced that? You've seen that in the world out there? There's people who process these sorts of things through who's inside. Because we're always the insider, right? That's, we're always on the inside. So who's the insider with me versus who's the outsider? And how do we interact? And if you found yourself doing that, let me just say, be careful. Because processing through such language will impact who you pray for and who you're willing to listen to and certainly who you're willing to eat with, which all, according to our model, impacts who you're willing to show love towards. And this is what the Pharisees are struggling with. You see, the Pharisees believed that they were the religious elite. They were the religious, they were the insiders. And they're the insiders, and they were not going to associate with tax collectors and sinners who were the outsiders. But this was confusing to them because the tax collectors and sinners were inside the party, while the Pharisees were outside the party, yet Jesus was inside the party, and this whole thing is just twisted to them. They can't make sense of how... This works. And so they're thinking to themselves and they're saying to themselves, no respectable rabbi would ever associate with the likes of these. And this is the part of the story where I like to picture Jesus who's, remember, inside while the Pharisees are outside, probably looking through a window. This is the part where I like to picture Jesus excusing himself from a conversation with a tax collector. 
walking over to the window, leaning out and going, excuse me, guys, but um, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. Then as Matthew continues, he said to them, go and learn what this means, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners. In case you missed it, he wasn't calling them healthy. In case you missed it, this wasn't a compliment to them. It's a backhanded comment. Jesus is basically saying to these guys, if you're really as righteous as you think you are, if you're really in, as, as in tune with, with God's grace and, and truth and love as, as you claim to be, then you know that God cares about those who are caught in sin. You know that God has a heart for those. And to argue otherwise is, is ridiculous as a doctor who refuses to go near sick people. It's basically what he's saying. And then he hits them with this quote from Hosea 6. Hosea 6, verse 6, where he says, I desire more mercy. Quoting the words of God spoken through the prophet Hosea. As God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And they would have known this verse. They would have known. The Pharisees were famous for, for uh, like, like just knowing passages forward and backwards. They, they were all stars in memorization. And, and, and in knowing how and why we perform rituals and sacrifices. That, that was their strength. That was their forte. But they were not in the business of mercy. Rather, here's what they would do to try to draw people back to God. Is that they, their tactics were to set the standard really high. And then they would strive to appear that they're living up to it. And when they could appear to live up to it, they could look down their fingers and judge those who didn't. And they were probably surprised why they're not invited to the parties. But that's not revealing the grace and the truth and the love of God then, and certainly not today. And so Jesus says, you know God desires mercy, but you don't know the first thing about what that means. You see, Jesus was on a mission in his life. He was on a mission that the Pharisees didn't understand. See, the Pharisees, their first priority was obeying the law. And we're going to obey the law to make sure you know that you're a sinner, to make sure you know what you need to change if you ever want to get back to God. And we're going to live this pious example so that you can measure yourself against us and know what it would look like if you want to come back to God. What was Jesus' first priority? His first priority was to bless people, to help them find their way back to God. Not just to point this contrasting image and go, well, if you ever make it, we'll love to see you up here. But to help them find their way back to God. And for Jesus, eating was central to his mission to seek and to save those who are far from God. Because it's one of the ways that he blessed and showed love to all. By being willing to share a meal with them, he was expressing friendship. He was expressing acceptance, not, not affirming what they were doing, but accepting them, saying, you have dignity, you have worth, there's a better plan for your life, and I would love to show you what that looks like. You see, in these moments, the table becomes a place of blessing, because in these moments shared in this fashion, the table becomes a place where we can reveal God's love. And his grace. You see, that wasn't the message of Jesus' life, was it? His life, his ministry, his sacrifice, wasn't, wasn't that really what it all kind of boils down to? Is, is that God loves you. And that God has made a way for you to have forgiveness for those sins. So that you can find your way back to God and have a relationship with him. Isn't that what the cross is about? About Jesus paying the price for our sins. So that all of us who are sinners, and all of us who are sinners, could find our way back to God in Jesus Christ. And as we think about what the cross means, as we think about what Jesus' mission was, if we think about what he was trying to communicate to these people, did you ever pause to consider that when he wanted to explain this to his followers, then and now, did you ever consider how he did it? 
Remember what he did? He gathered them in a room, and he sat them around a table, and they shared one last meal together as he explained what this was all going to be about. And we see this in Luke 22. Beginning in verse 14, it says, When the hour came, and the hour before he would be arrested and tried and crucified and give his life for the sins of the world, when, when the hour had come for this all to start taking place, Jesus and his apostles reclined at a table. And while they were reclining around that table, he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this meal with you. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And there's such incredible promise in there that there will be a day when we gather around the table of Jesus Christ. But in this particular time, he says, the last time we'll eat this together. They're reclined in fellowship. They're, they're reclined in friendship. They're listening to one another of the stories of the day and, and anticipations of what's to come and the uncertainty that goes around that. But then, but then Jesus says and does something that nobody expects. As in verse 19, it says that Jesus then took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. The news that he'd been sharing with them the previous days was hard for them to hear. He'd been talking about the fact that he was going to be handed over and, and tried, and it didn't, it didn't quite make sense. And they were confused as to what was going to happen and why he would allow it to happen. And here he is again, breaking this bread and saying, this is my body, which is going to be broken. It's going to be beaten. It's going to be bruised. It's going to be stabbed. It's going to be hung on a tree. And understand why. But in verse 20, he gives them a glimpse into why. When in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he says, this cup is the new promise, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Declaring a new promise was being made. And it would be made in his blood. You see, this would have had significance to them as they gather around for this Passover feast. You see, in the old sacrificial system that the Pharisees were very, very aware of, if you wanted to atone for your sins, if you wanted to find forgiveness, you would, you would take a lamb and you would place your hand on the lamb's head and, and they, would, they would kill the lamb. And, and then they would, they would collect some of the blood and, and they, would, they would sacrifice the body upon an altar be burnt and they would sprinkle the blood. And this was a means by which a person could find forgiveness under the old sacrificial system. It's a way that you can confess your sins by laying the penalty of your sins upon this lamb. And this lamb would give its life in place of you. But here's the problem. The minute you walked out the door of the temple, you, you just go sin again. And you have to go find another lamb and do it again. And, and, and lamb after lamb, sin after sacrifice, sin after sacrifice, the perpetual system would continue and you would never find this, this place of wholeness and fellowship with God that had any lasting significance. But Jesus Christ is saying here, I have a new promise for you. As the perfect sinless Lamb of God, I will make one sacrifice for all sins for all time. And people no longer need to try to find their way back to God by attempts at piety. They no longer need to find their way back through repeated sacrificing of something of themselves or something that they own. It's, it's not about piety. It's not about sacrifice. It's about placing your faith in God's grace made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Demonstrated through a meal. The great theologian and author N.T. Wright says this. He says, when Jesus Christ himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about... He didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. He gave them a meal. A meal that becomes foundational to the church for the past 2,000 years and that unifies all people of Christ together around a table that all are invited to, to share a meal of his grace and his forgiveness and of his blessing, a table that you can invite people to come and be around. A table you can invite your friends and your families and your neighbors and your co-workers to come and share in what the psalmist says in Psalm 34 when it says, Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in him. So here's the question I have for you as we consider all these things that I've shared with you this morning. 
do you believe you can do that? Do you believe that there are people that are open to sharing their lives with you, possibly around a table, that you could listen to, that you could share stories with, and just maybe share a story of Jesus Christ with? Do you believe that that is possible, that you could do that? Because I am completely convinced that all of us can do that, that you can do that. It will take some time. It will take some intentional effort on all of our parts to do it. But this model that we're working through, these five steps we're working through, they're not five days. They're not five weeks. It's a process. We're describing a process of building trust, of, of building relationship with people. It, we're talking here about a way of living where you have an awareness and an openness to be used by God to lead people back to God. Do you believe you could do that? Let me share a story with you before I close on what this could look like in your life, in the real world life in which we all live. And it's a story that, that Dave and John Ferguson, the, the, the researchers and sort of the authors of this BLESS model, you know, share about some friends of theirs named Brooke and Justin. And Brooke and Justin uh, live in a neighborhood where their home, right beside them, was one of these homes, these rental homes with a revolving door. Uh, people would come and go just constantly, every couple of months for like five years. This would take place. And every time a new person moved in, th- th- there'd be excitement, like, like maybe they're going to stay. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe we can, you know, we can build a relationship. Maybe, maybe we can get to know them, but they'd quickly be let down as somebody would move in and they would hope and they'd pray, but then... They quickly depart. But, but they would keep praying, and they, and they would pray, God, you know that this house is vacant again next to us. Lord, bring us a neighbor that we can love. Bring us a neighbor that we can do life with. And sure enough, one day, a young family named Lauren and Quentin moved in next door. And Brooke and Justin welcomed them and started intentionally just interacting with them. You know, more, than, more than just, just the wave as you drive out of your garage to go to work, and then the wave as you come back, and that's the extent of our interactions. No, like, like intentionally walking across the, the lawn to say, hi, morning, how are you doing? And they started asking questions, and they, they started listening, and they started fostering this relationship. Not, not, not for any project or alter, alternative motives. They, they genuinely wanted to know their neighbors. And after a few weeks, they eventually invited them over for a barbecue. And, and to their delight, Lauren and Quentin agreed to, to come for this barbecue. And, and during this time, they had this long conversation about, about jobs and, and favorite sports teams and, and family and, 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 you know, and what they do for favorite restaurants and recreation. And this relationship started to deepen just over this barbecue. It went to this new level through this time of having a barbecue. And a couple of weeks later pass, and, and they realize that Lauren and Quincy don't have a, a lawnmower. And so Justin asks, is it, is it okay if I cut your grass while I'm cutting my grass? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. We haven't got the money to buy a lawnmower right now. That would that'd help us out a lot. And, and so Justin started cutting his grass every week for him. And then a little while later, Lauren comes over to, to Brooke and says, why are you guys so different? Like, why are you always going out of your way to show interest in us and and to help us and and to care for us? And Brooke said, well, we love because he first loved us. And shared a little bit of her story and how she has come to know the love of Jesus in her life. And and that didn't really seem to go anywhere until a few weeks later when when Quentin walked across the lawn and, and found Justin and said, hey, can I talk to you for a second, my my uncle just died. And man, I got, I got questions about, about God and about the afterlife and how that all works. And, and I, know, I know you're a person of faith. And so can I talk to you for a while? And they sat in the front yard for a couple hours. And at the end of that conversation, Justin led Quentin to salvation in Jesus Christ. And a week later, he was baptized in their church. This is... A true story that began with prayer, asking God to create opportunities and then having our eyes and our ears open for those opportunities and seizing the opportunity to listen, to invite to share around a table, to serve one another, and to share a story. 
Begin with prayer. Listen. Eat. Serve. Story about Jesus Christ. You see how it all fits together? Can you see that? That natural, organic way that we can love people and maybe even lead them to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, many of you maybe are open to praying more. Pastor Mark, I, I'll start with praying more. Fantastic. Some of you may say, you know what, I'm going to listen. I'm going to try and find some people to listen to a little more closely. I'm going to quit you know, thinking ahead what I'm going to say when they quit talking. I'm going to listen better. But I know that this third one is a little bit more challenging, this idea of inviting people over for dinner. Uh, I don't know about that. And you might be thinking, I'm not sure about that. I don't really like people in my house. <laughs> I, I have kind of a messy house. I, 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 I'm not a good cook. I, I have a rather small table. I can only fit one. I, I don't know. If you're thinking of excuses like that, eat out. Order in. Do what Jesus did. Just invite yourself over to somebody else's house. Like, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure you can find a solution to it. Well, Pastor Mark, I don't have the time. I, I barely have time to eat dinner with my own family. Well, it sounds like you know where to begin listening. <laughs> Maybe start listening and praying for time in your own home, with your own family, and not be looking beyond the walls of your house. Maybe it starts in your own home and grows from there. Well, Pastor Mark, but I'm, I'm kind of shy. I wouldn't know what to say, and everyone hates that awkward silence around the table, right? Well, uh, two suggestions on that. Number one, remember last week we talked about the four H's to listen for. Go back and listen to last week. There's the four H's that will help you understand things you can perhaps talk about. Or here's here's something that I think works really, really well. Another option is just invite another person over who's really chatty. (laughs) Let them do all the talking. You can just be the host and serve and jump in when you're able to do so. But, But here's the point, folks. It begins with understanding, do you believe that your kitchen table... That the table at McDonald's, that the table out in the foyer at the New Life Cafe, that the table that goes over the top of a hospital bed, that the table we gather around for the communion table, these can be places where you can be blessed and where you can be a blessing. Do we believe that? I believe it. And I believe we can do it. Because when we gather around the table for that purpose with the heart of Jesus Christ, people will be heard. People will be known. People will feel cared for. And I believe that when that takes place, they will experience God's grace. They will experience his mercy. And so I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to go into the world with beginning with prayer, with listening, and seeking to experience the blessing of being around the table together. And for those of us who are here, and have never been invited to sit at Jesus' table of grace and forgiveness. Before I pray and close, I just want to pull out a chair and invite you to sit down. Because I want you to know this as you sit down at the table of God's grace. That God loves you. And that our sin, it, it separates us from God. It always has and it always will. And that there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do to be good enough. There is nothing we can sacrifice that will ever be enough but we need to understand that Jesus Christ is enough to pay the price for our sin. And when he made that sacrifice, that one-time sacrifice for all sin, for all people, for all time, he then extends his hands, his nail-scarred hands, and offers you the grace of forgiveness. It is a free gift that he offers to all people. And if you want to learn more about that, remember... Alpha starts tomorrow night, and we will process that for the next few weeks. Go see Andrew at the Next Steps area. Sign up for Alpha to learn more about that. But if you've already heard enough of Jesus Christ and you want to take that step right now, you simply need to accept that I am a sinner and that I need a Savior. And you say those words yourself, that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And then believe that Jesus Christ is that Savior, that he was the sufficient sacrifice, perfect, spotless Lamb of God, who gave his life in our place and confess our need for that and to receive it, you will find the grace and forgiveness and the blessing of the table of Jesus Christ. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example that we have in the word of God of of how you loved us first while we were yet sinners. 
about how you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sins upon the cross. For those who are listening online, those who are here, Lord, who perhaps have never made that profession of faith, Lord, I I just invite them in this moment as the Spirit leads them to have the courage to step forward in their hearts and say, thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sins, a price I could never afford. I believe you are the one, the only one, Whoever could afford it. And as you paid that price and gave your life for me, I now give you mine. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. And then for those of us, Lord, who are gathered here, who, who have made that profession of faith, whether now or in the days past, God, use us in these days ahead. That we may go forth to be ambassadors of your grace and of your forgiveness. That we may pull chairs back at our tables that people may sit down and hear the story of Jesus Christ. And we may help them find their way back to God. That your glory, that your kingdom may be known. Lord, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the truth to which we proclaim. This is the truth to which we stand and build our lives. May you be honored. May you be glorified. Amen.